the red light and, uh, and uh, the red light and green. Uh, actually, Dr. Torina uh, was very wise to take the colors that Marcus Garvey had identified as a flag. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the flag, uh, the black man's flag, black woman's flag, the African nation's flag, it's uh, it, all over the world where the black people, you see the red, black, and the green. Yeah. And it, it is wonderful because uh, the red is for our blood and struggle, and the green is for uh, life and productivity, the future, and of course the strength of the black cattle. Uh, we recognize it as, as us, the people. Uh, one of the uh, important aspects of our history is that almost anywhere at any time uh, you can think of in terms of the history of our people. There are always people who rise up to the occasion to, to be uh, individuals who uh, carry on the, the greatest tradition of our people. Uh, you look at almost any era. Uh, when uh, African people were still in bondage in this country, uh, there was a man by the name of Charles Remond. Actually, before Frederick Douglass, most people have forgotten Charles Remond, but Remond was the uh, interpreter of the dreams and the visions and the passions of African people before Douglass. And, um, and then, of course, we had uh, Henry Holland Garnett. And Garnett was in many ways one of the uh, people that I read most when I was a young person because Henry Holland Garnett was, of course, uh, in his own time and era, just a brilliant interpreter of what African people had to do. And then we had uh, uh, Frederick Douglass, of course, himself, and Sojourner Truth, who just said all she wanted to do was to tell the truth mm -hmm. and to sojourn, which mm -hmm. means to journey, to travel and tell the truth. That's how she got her name. She, she grew up speaking Dutch and uh, German and learned English. Uh, but as an enslaved young woman, uh, she decided one day that she's just going to go around and just tell the truth about the conditions she saw of black people. This was her, her brilliance. And, uh, we had, we, we've had people like that. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, then we've had the scholars, the, the, the so-called uh, intellectuals who have risen up like that. I mean, John Henry Clark, for example. Um, we had the, uh, uh, many people have forgotten John Jackson. But John Jackson, one of the first rationalists we have ever had, uh, wrote uh, the introduction uh, to African civilization. And then not only that, but John Jackson was the one who also told us uh, that there were um, uh, there were crucified, 16 crucified uh, Christ before Jesus Christ. You know, the, the, we had black, we, Chancellor Williams, we had all of the destruction of black. All I am saying is that Chike Akua is in this tradition. This is the tradition out of which he comes. He, he's not uh, someone who uh, just appeared now He's someone who has been appearing over and over again. He is, in many ways, this reincarnation of all of these geniuses. Mm -hmm. And he brings to us his special gifts of interpretation and uh, understanding of our history and culture. Uh, he, he's, uh, he, he's, he's done a magnificent job already. And with 10 books, uh, he has demonstrated his uh, commitment to a scholarship and his commitment to uh, demonstrating also what African people can and ought to do. We, we are delighted. We are, we are pleased. We are honored. We, we don't know what to say. This brother is in the, this brother is in the, in the Malefic Cathy and Sante Institute with us today. It just brings us great joy. And we want to just thank him for coming and we want to Ask him to come and to share with us at this time. Brother Chief. Everybody say it's our time. It's our time. It's our season. It's our season. Come on, it's our time. It's our time. It's our season. It's our season.
limits. No, no limits. limits. no boundaries. No boundaries. I see blessings. I see blessings. All around me. All around. No limits. No limits. No boundaries. No boundaries. I see blessings. I see blessings. All around me. All around me. Give yourselves a black hand. It's 11.59 on the clock of destiny. Okay. And life is like a minute. Only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon you, can't refuse it. Didn't seek it, didn't choose it. But it's up to you to use it. You'll suffer if you lose it. Give account if you abuse it. It's only a minute, but eternity is in it. And with that minute, you, me, and we can change and transform the world. Now, if you believe that we are changing and transforming the world right now, would you please say Ashe? Ashe. Wonderful. So you all know that Ashe means I agree. It means let it be so. But it also represents the activating energy in the presence of the spirit that is both within us and around us at all times. And so, of course, I'll be using that word as a call and response this afternoon. Ashe? Ashe. Let me tell you what a, an incredible honor, privilege, and blessing it is to be here at the Malefi K. Asante Institute for Afrocentric Studies. Uh, I'm deeply humbled to be here with you all to share a quick message about Kwanzaa Connections, the keys to the culture. And as I was sharing with Dr. Asante before the program started, I thought I knew something about Afrocentricity until I started my doctoral studies and had to really do a, a careful review of his literature. And I'm still doing a careful review of the literature. But someone who has, I don't know if you're aware of this, but when you, when you discover or, or, or de, you, you define a discipline, you also have to produce a literature for that discipline. And that, that just defining the discipline itself is one thing, but then producing the literature to define and defend the, the, the theory is a whole other animal. Ashe? Ashe. And so we're in the midst truly of a scholar warrior who is uh, a man of, of emotepic productivity. Ashe? Ashe? And so let's please give him a wonderful round of applause for the Doing that as, as a scholar, as a professor, <laughs> traveling nationally, internationally, raising a family, and all that goes along with it, I am profoundly humbled to be in your presence, Father. And so let's uh, talk a little bit about Kwanzaa Connections. I want to bring you greetings from the Teacher Transformation Institute, where we use standards-based, research-driven, Afrocentric and culturally relevant instructional strategies to increase student achievement. When you hear people talking about standards-based instruction. You need to ask the question, who's standards? Right. Ashe? Ashe. And so we go around to schools, school systems, colleges, universities, and educational conferences working with teachers and parents and directly with students to bring out the brilliance in our children. Ashe? Ashe. In addition to that, in the black studies paradigm, we're taught that you cannot have a critique without a correction. You can't talk about the problem unless you have a solution. solution. So my wife and I, this past year, started Saba Academy, serving grades one through five, and we're located just outside of Atlanta in Lithonia, Georgia. Ashe? Ashe. All right. Uh, what we're involved in with African Origins on Tour is illuminating the link between history and destiny. And it's part of a large and longer set of presentations that we do to reconnect our people to their roots, dealing with African origins of writing and mathematics, African sacred science, how many of y'all saw Majesty of the Moors yesterday? Let me see a show of hands. I see a few familiar faces. Wonderful. So we thank you for coming out today. Uh, African origins uh, of our faith. Magnificent black women in history. And then I was called to St. Louis right after the incident with Mike Brown, and we did something called Operation Transformation. Five things every black person should know. Ashe? So it's in the tradition of our ancestors that we always begin by giving honor to the Most High was known by many names and worshipped in many ways, certainly the one source and the one force through which we all live, move, and have our being. Ashe? Ashe. We also give honor to our ancestors because there's an African proverb which says, if we stand tall, mm -hmm. it's because we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors, or as Dr. Jacob Carruthers has said, indeed our stride is wide because we're walking in the footsteps of giants. Ashe? Ashe. If you're already get into it, everybody say, let's get it. Let's get it. All right, so what is Kwanzaa? Now, I, I know I'm looking at some seasoned soldiers and warriors right now. So you might be thinking, oh, come on, Brother Chico, you're gonna ask me, what is Kwanzaa? I've been at this for five, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. But see, one of the things that I've noticed, the gap that we have in our community is what Dr. Asa Hilliard called 
uh, intergenerational cultural transmission. Somebody say, break that down. <laughs> that is passing on the best of what we know to the children. So you might know what Kwanzaa is. Question is, do you know how to break it down to a child that this, that's this big? Do you know how to break it down to the brothers on the street corner? Ashe? Do you know how to break it down to the sisters in the beauty salon? You see, so we got to go back to basics. And, and so I hope you won't be insulted if I just go back through some of the basics because when I used to teach middle school and I asked my students, do you know what Kwanzaa is? They said, oh yeah, Mr. Cool, I know what that is. That's like, a, that's like a black way of celebrating Christmas, right? Mm. <laughs> and I said, no. Uh, actually, it has absolutely nothing to do with Christmas. Okay, so we got to break it down and go back. So Kwanzaa, of course, is a Swahili word. Which means first fruits, I say. It is a harvest celebration. It's an African American and Pan African cultural holiday, celebrated from December 26th to, to January 1st, I say. But we practice the principles year round. Can I say that again? It's celebrated from December 26th to January 1st, but we practice the principles what? Year round. It is a harvest celebration. <laughs> it is where, in Dr. Karinga's research, he discovered that African people, wherever they were, came together to honor, elevate, and celebrate their ancestors, right? That's right. And to give thanks to the Creator for a bountiful harvest and to uplift and celebrate the good. Ashe? Ashe. And so, when Dr. Karinga created Kwanzaa, uh, and see, this is why knowledge is so important and a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because you have some people who would do a little bit of research and they'll say, you know, that, that Kwanzaa thing, that ain't even a traditional African celebration. It was founded in 1966. A little bit of knowledge is dangerous, I say. You got to go a little bit deeper and understand that in Dr. Karinga's research, he went and studied harvest celebration traditions all throughout the continent. And whether he was in East Africa dealing with, with, uh, with uh, Kemet, Nubia, and Kush, or whether he was in West Africa dealing with Ghana and Mali and Samoa, or whether he was in Southern Africa dealing with Great Zimbabwe, he noticed that all of these traditions had several things in common. And one of those was that they all had a harvest celebration where they elevated and celebrated the ancestors, where they gave thanks to the Creator for a bountiful harvest, and where they celebrated and uplifted all that is good. Ashe? Ashe. And so that is why his work is so important on a number of levels. Another scholar warrior now, right? Chairman of the Department of Black Studies at University of California at Long Beach and founder of the organization US. Here's another person who developed a theory but couldn't stop there, had to develop the body of knowledge, the literature to go along with the theory. Ashe? So not only developing and creating Kwanzaa, but also going back, uh, following the mandates of Dr. Sheikh Hatadiyah, rescuing uh, and reconstructing African history and culture and putting it back into the hands of those that created it. Right. So he wrote the Book of Coming Forth by Day. He wrote selections from the Husiya. Right. He wrote the Odu Ifa, right. the ethical teachings of the Yoruba. Right. And then for his second dissertation, y'all didn't hear what I just said. Because yeah. 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 you missed a good place to say Ashe. Yeah. Yeah. I'm working on one. <laughs> And I'm wondering who would suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune to write to. In his second dissertation, does an entire study of the ancient African principle of Ma'at, the ancient moral ideal of ancient Kemet. So this is uh, a scholar par excellence. And six the, since the 60s has been arguing that the key crisis in African American life is a cultural crisis. Somebody say cultural crisis. Cultural crisis. That is the views and the values. <laughs> and not only that, but he says until we break the monopoly the pressure has on our minds, liberation is not only impossible, but what? Unthinkable. Unthinkable. He's been saying that since the 60s. Right. Has anything changed? No. Has anything changed? No. Do we still have chains on the brain? Yes. I say? And so that is one of the reasons why uh, we wrote this book uh, a Kwanzaa Awakening, yes. Lessons for the Community. Why? For the purpose of intergenerational cultural transmission. Yes. Because everybody that knows something about Kwanzaa may not necessarily know how to share it with young people. And so you know what I did? I went into my file cabinet and I began, uh, when I could not find a book that had great lesson plans and things like that for me to teach the students that I was teaching, I began developing my own. You know, lesson plans, activities, and 
worksheets, a test, a quiz, poetry, all that kind of stuff. And then the spirit of the Most High and the ancestors whispered to me and said, if you were looking for a book for Kwanzaa to teach to your children and couldn't find one, don't you think there's some other teachers out there like that? Mm -hmm. So take your lesson plans, put them together, mm -hmm. and put it in book form so that other people can benefit from that. I said? I said. And that's exactly what we did. So this book talks about the history of Kwanzaa. It gives a sample libation ceremony. It has a three-act play. Uh, and because I come out of the Christian tradition and am a minister of the gospel as well, I said, I need to make it clear to people in the church that it's okay. I say, I say. you know, because they always thought I was kind of odd anyway, because I was always talking about this African stuff. So I wrote a chapter called Kwanzaa and Christ so that they could see the elements of the principles in the very scriptures that they read. Mm -hmm. Now, and then I called on one of my friends who, uh, who was Muslim, and I asked him, I said, can you write something about the, the, the illumination of those principles in the Quran? Mm -hmm. I say, mm -hmm. because one of the things that you must understand is that Kwanzaa is a non-religious holiday. Mm -hmm. Because Dr. Karenga understood we were separated mm -hmm. due to our religions, mm -hmm. but we were catching hell because we were black. Mm -hmm. And they didn't ask you if you were Christian. They didn't ask you if you were Muslim. They didn't ask you if you were Sunni, Shiite, Catholic, Methodist, Baptist, whatever you were, as long as you were black. Then you were catching hell in the streets. And as long as you're black, you're catching hell in the streets today as well. And so we don't care what your religion is or if you have a religion or not. We know that you're part of the family, and we stand on traditional African values. I say? I say. And so we have worksheets and a test, lessons for the little ones, and even a, a poetry corner to demonstrate Kaumba. This is the work that we've done to bridge the gap between Afrocentric theory and classroom practice and home practice. I say? So we've developed all these books and DVDs and posters and all of these different things. Uh, because one of the things that Dr. Karenga taught us out of his social theory called Kawaida. Everybody say Kawaida. Kawaida. Now don't get this mixed up between Kawaida and Kwanzaa. I want you to think of an umbrella. And Kawaida is the umbrella. And, Ka and Kwanzaa is just one thing that comes under that umbrella. Ashe? So what is Kawaida? Kawaida is an ongoing synthesis of the best. Everybody say the best. Yes. The best of African culture, philosophy, and tradition. Why the best? Because we had not been introduced to the best. The worst of our culture has been placed in broad circulation all over the world through skillful media manipulation. Ashe? Ashe. And so Dr. Karim said, with Kawaida, everybody say Kawaida. Kawaida. We want an ongoing synthesis of bringing together of the best of our traditions because we have only been intentionally introduced to the worst. Ashe? Ashe. Why should we celebrate Kwanzaa? Let's take a look at it. Okay. The great one, Dr. John Henry Clark, said the task before Africans, both at home and abroad, is to restore to their memory, everybody say memory, yeah. what slavery and colonialism made them forget. Then he goes on to tell us that this job of miseducation in, Af in Africa was so complete it was tantamount to a brain transplant. Mm -hmm. How many of y'all know some black folk that have lost their minds? Let me see a show of hands. Keep your hand up, look around the room now, right? I see some of y'all with two hands. Some of y'all waving a foot. Two of y'all know what? See, we got some work to do. Why celebrate Kwanzaa? Because we need to reconnect to our roots. And so Dr. Asante tells us that the definition of Afrocentricity means placing African ideals at the center of any analysis that involves African culture and behavior. Dr. Asante, for years I've been trying to explain this to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And because I'm a teacher, I'm always trying to figure out the best way and use visuals and all those sorts of things. And this is pretty much the best thing I can come up with. If you think of us as a people, but well, before I get to that, mm -hmm. bridging the gap, you got Afrocentric theory and philosophy. Mm -hmm. Then you got the home and classroom practice. Then you got a rising tide of continuous mm -hmm. racism and white supremacy ideology. I say? Okay. So here's what we do: we create curriculum and methods to what? Bridge the gap. I say? That's what this is about. That's when you see the table with all the different things that we produce. We're doing what? We're bridging the gap. Yeah. I say? So think of this uh, Afrocentricity as a circle with a dot in the middle. You. As an individual are the dot in the middle, and us as a collective, we are this dot in the middle. So the dot in the, in the middle represents me and you as an individual, but also what? 
us as a collective. And this circle represents our community. And everything that we need and could possibly want is within this circle as long as we stay centered. Everybody say centered. Center. So our location right now is we're centered. And when we're centered in the best of the culture, centered in what? The best, the best of the culture. Look at what we now have access to. If you can read it, call it out. Call out what you want. Just call Our it out. Unity, love, love, safety, unity, unity resilience, love. security, safety, safety. Now, watch this. As long as we have access to all this and more, as long as we stay what? Centered. But we live in a society that through certain forces and factors acts like a magnet that attempts to decenter us. Ashe? So our location before was we were centered. Now we've been what? Decentered. Watch this now. Now what are we vulnerable to once we've been decentered? Call it out. Call it out. Let me hear you. Oh, hey, disrespect, disrespect, unemployment. So we've been decentered. And now we are subject to all of the ills of a Eurocentric society. Mm -hmm. But if we've been decentered, now we must be recentered. Re Can I say that again? Mm -hmm. We've been decentered, now we must be what? Recentered. Re and that's why we need to celebrate Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. I say? Because Kwanzaa allows us to get re-centered so that we can stay centered. Ashe? Ashe. Because if you're not centered, what happens today is we lose sight of what's normal. Mm -hmm. See, these images are not normal to a lot of black folk. Mm -hmm. And they will argue you mm -hmm. to try to convince you that this is not normal right. and try to convince you that this is normal. Right. Uh, hello? hello. Uh oh wait a minute. <laughs> See, when you don't know what normal is, then you begin to think that it's normal for black men to abuse black women. You begin to think that it's normal for black people to be economically in, uh, impotent. You begin to think that it's normal for us to underachieve in school. You begin to think that it's normal to be in a black neighborhood with no black businesses because you've lost sight of what is normal because you've been decentered and dislocated. I say, if we be decenter, we must be what? Recenter. And Kwanzaa helps us to do that. Listen, there's an African proverb that says, if the wise village elders don't teach the youth, the village idiots most certainly will. And if you don't know who the village idiots are, just turn on the television on any given day at any given time. I say? So I've been going around the country to schools, elementary, middle, high school, college, and universities asking the questions, what does it mean to be black? Because we've lost sight, somebody else, we allowed somebody else to come in and tell us that to be black means to be a pimp, player, criminal, and thug. And you say, Brother Chica, that's not what it means to be black. Yeah, but what are our children saying? Because that's what they've been led to believe. Through skillful media manipulation. Oh, they, they got it down to a science, y'all. They're creating these images in their studios, yeah. looking for certain traits and to put it out all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. And then what happens when they put those images out all over the world, it becomes justification yes. yep. for the murder of Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. justification for the murder mm -hmm. of Eric Garner, justification for the prosecution of Marissa Alexander, Mike Brown, mm -hmm. Marley Pinnock, and, and countless others. I say? I say. So people look at those images and they say, well, look, that's how they act anyway. Yeah, they need to be shot down. Look at how they act. Yeah, they need to be choked. Look at how they act. Yeah, they need to be put in jail. I say? I say. We got to flip the script and get reset. I say? So I was called down to, uh, out to uh, St. Louis shortly after the incident with Mike Brown to speak to over 100 young brothers. Uh, about these issues that were going on, going on, and many of them were from the Ferguson area. And they were they were deeply troubled. And see, we got to change the narrative on that as well. Yeah. Somebody say, break that down. Break it down. Yeah. Break it down. I want you to watch when you watch the news now. I want you to watch with this set of lenses. Watch how many times they refer to the demonstrations becoming violent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing how they will attempt? to assume some type of moral authority and call out violence, who has created more violence in the world than them? 
So you never allow your oppressor to dictate the ways in which you will resist oppression. You never allow them to somehow stand on a moral high ground when they have none. I say? So yes, I stand with those brothers. I'm proud of those brothers who took those canisters of tear gas and threw them back. I'm proud of those brothers who stood in front of the black businesses and said, your agent provocateurs who have interrupted our demonstration will not break into this building and burn down our businesses. I say? And some of y'all got a little quiet when I said agent provocateurs and you might not know that history. Go back and check it out in the civil rights movement and the black power movement, That's where right. they would send in, they would pay off certain That's black right. people right. to go into the marches and demonstrations right. to cause problems and conflicts right. so that they could then say that the march turned violent. Yeah. See, that's why you got to know your history. Yeah. 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 And so we asked the question, how did we go from kings and queens to criminals and crackers? How did we go from pyramid builders to pimps and players? From, from mothers and fathers of civilization to welfare mothers and deadbeat dads, from building the world's first libraries and writing the first books and carrying guns and shooting books. Oh, There's been some mental manipulation going on. Oh, and so we need to understand who we are. So if you can read this, I want you to read it with me. Who are we? One, two, three. We are mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, friends and neighbors who know how to help others. We are now lawyers and engineers, ministers, pastors, and spiritual seers. Educators, counselors, and business owners, accountants, dentists, and even organ donors, craftsmen, plumbers, and computer technicians, architects, builders, and also electricians. We are extraordinary people with an extraordinary history, raising families to leave a lasting legacy. Give yourselves a black hand. that the true worth of a race must be measured by the character of its woman. And if we are to re restore our people to their traditional greatness, then we must celebrate and celebrate the black woman as such. I say, so Kwanzaa is first fruits. That's, I know you know the Nguzo Saba, but let's go through it again. Is that all right? And so if you will, please repeat after me. Uh, umoja. umoja. Unity. 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 Listen. Umoja means you to strive for and maintain unity within the family, community, nation, and race. Everybody say Kuchi Chagulia. Kuchi Chagulia. Self-determination. Self-determination. To define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. In my graduate studies, this is so important, defining ourselves and naming ourselves. Because when we study theories and methodologies and epistemology, and, and all you have is a, it's a litany of white male ideas. You mean to tell me black people didn't have any theories? You mean to tell me black people didn't have any methodologies? And it's not that we didn't have it. It's that it's been suppressed. Right. And if you're not careful, you can go through school and think that your people didn't do nothing. And then you find yourself doing your master's thesis and your doctoral dissertation using decentered European theories to explain African phenomena. That's right. That's right. That's right. And now you become proud of the problem rather than the solution. Right. I had a dramatic awakening. I had to ask the question, is it education or separation? Right. I'm going to say that again. Is that education or separation? My first semester of my doctoral studies, I was sitting in a three-hour class at the 90-minute mark. We got a little 10-minute break, and I went out into the hallway, and there were two brothers out there about to throw down, about to fight. I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, this is a college, this is a university, how could this be happening? So now I've become a middle school teacher all over again, right? Ready to, to break it up like I oftentimes had to do. And, and I, I was able to talk the brothers down and get them to go their separate ways. And when I finally went back to class and got myself settled down, right, mm -hmm. and sat down, it was as if the Spirit of the Most High and the ancestors whispered to me, listen, don't ever forget where you came from. Mm -hmm. Don't ever think you can get so much education mm -hmm. that you can't reach those brothers right there. Mm -hmm. That's why I asked the question, is it education or separation? Because the more of their education we get, the less we are able to talk to the average brother on the street. That's important. So now we got Ujima. Everybody say Ujima. Ujima. Collective work and responsibility. Yes. Ujima. Cooperative economics. Yes. And this is one thing about this Mike Brown case. With the Trayvon Martin case, we did not connect that situation 
to economic empowerment. Yeah. We got it this time because it happened near Black Friday. Mm -hmm. And we're told that sales were down 7 to 11%. Mm -hmm. and now we know we got to hit them in the pocketbook. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody say here. Yeah. 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 Purpose. Purpose. Right? Kumba. 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 Yeah. Creativity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Imani. 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 Faith. Faith. So those are the seven gems and jewels that we call the Nguzo Saba or the seven principles. So did you know that the lighting of the candles represents bringing light to the principles by the way we live our lives? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, brothers and sisters, let's, let's just do this. I want to leave you as I close with this powerful story from yes. Reverend Dr. Shaka Musa Bereshengo. Mm -hmm. And it's called The Fabled City of Pali. Now, if you listen very carefully, you will hear each of the seven principles of Kwanzaa demonstrated in this story. Ashe? Ashe. All right. The Fabled City of Pali. It, it is the story of a traveler who travels to uh, al Kibula, the original name of, one of the original names of Africa. And he walks, he stumbles upon this city called Pali. And he had never been to a city like this before. He walked from one end of the city to the other and was amazed at what he saw. And finally, he saw an elder, a venerable elder, in the direction of the setting sun. And he said, sir, can you help me, please? Something is wrong. And the elder said, well, what can I do for you, my brother? And he said... I don't know what's happening. Am I hallucinating? Am I having a sunstroke? Or I don't know what's going on. He said, well, what's the problem? He said, sir, I've traveled all over the world, including all over this wonderful continent of Alkibalan, but I have never seen a place like this city called Pali. I traveled from one end to the other. And so the elder said, well, what exactly did you see? He said, well, you know, I, I went through the business districts. There were businesses that were flourishing and doing so well. I walked through the residential districts, and all I saw was mansions, nothing but mansions. The streets were clean. The, the, the lawns were finely manicured. The children were out in the, in the streets playing with, with, with peace and love. And everywhere I went, I felt this feeling of love and joy and peace. He said, now, this cannot be. Everywhere I've traveled, you always have a lower class. And then you have an upper class and a middle class that acts as a buffer between the two. He said, now, am I hallucinating or am I having a real experience? Well, the elder just smiled and rubbed his beard and said, well, brother, you're not hallucinating and you're not having a sunstroke. We pride ourselves and having built a community where everyone can thrive and flourish and prosper in the city of Pali. He said, but how did you do it? He said, well, if you desire to become a resident of the city of Pali, we meet with the council of the elders and the mothers of the city. And then we bring you in for an interview. And we ask you questions to determine if you have the type of character that we want in the residents of the city of Pali. And once we've met with the council of the elders and the mothers of the city, and then we come together and we discuss what we learned about you, and if we determine that you were a person of character, culture, consciousness, and conviction, then we welcome you to become a resident of the city of Pali. And on the day that we welcome you, there is a, a community-wide celebration where the entire city comes out, and everybody brings two things. Everybody say two things. Two things. A brick. A brick. And a dollar. And a dollar. So now the traveler is like a brick and a dollar. And the elder says, yes, a brick and a dollar. Because on the day we welcome you, as a resident of the city of Pali, everybody gives you that brick and a dollar. That's why everybody has a match. He said, well, how many people y'all got here? He said, oh, we got about 500,000. He said, y'all got half a million people? He said, that's why everyone here has a mansion, because we help you to build it, too. I say, how many of y'all would like to be a resident of the fabled city of Kali? I say, but listen, if you understand the seven principles of Kwanzaa, the fabled city of Pali doesn't have to be a fable. I say, we can build strong communities. We can practice Umoja, unity. We can practice Kujichagalia, self-determination. We can practice Ujima, collective work and responsibility. Ujima, cooperative economics. Nia, purpose. Kaumba, creativity. And round it out with the faith that has sustained us from generations. Imani, which means faith. Ashe? Ashe. So brothers and sisters, when we do that, we must remember the That's words right. of Bangal who said, never forget where you came from. And always praise the bridges that carry you over. Mm -hmm. And the African proverb, if you want to go fast, 
go alone. But if you want to go far, go, go together. together. Brothers and sisters, let's go together. Peace and blessings. And you know, and, and, and let me let me just say before we go, we, go, we just want to say a few words. There are we have books, we have posters, we have DVDs um, in the back. And uh, before you go, please uh, uh, get uh, uh, Chi Kua's uh, DVDs and his books, and also just really just uh, honor this brother who has given us such a powerful lecture. Yeah. Thank you. you, you, you. You know, one of the things I wanted to do was to introduce you uh, to uh, the, a new faculty member at Temple University in the Department of Africology. He's a young brother that we have a lot of uh, faith and confidence in. We just want him just to say uh, just a few words here. He's Dr. Amari Johnson. He's going to be joining us in January in the Department of Africology. We're really delighted to have him. Uh, with us here today. Uh, Dr. Mari. Good afternoon, Peace. How you doing? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's so wonderful to be here with you. I want to thank Dr. Asante. And I also want to ask, now what made him think he could put me up here after Brother <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I had the honor of hearing Brother Chike last uh, a few months ago. And I just remember sitting there as he was talking to a private, it was about 150, 200 young brothers, and I was just like, man, I got to read some more. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's great to be here. And, and I got to acknowledge my man, my brother, Rich Robinson, who's a very active member of uh, the Philadelphia cultural community, the dancer is also an educator. And I don't want to take too much of your time. I do want to say it's really wonderful to be here. Um, in these times, because December comes around, I always hear that song in my mind. It's the most wonderful Ooh. time. Does that, mean, does that means it's Kwanzaa time now. I've got it. <laughs> it's been a few years, but it, there was a point in my life where it was like, you know, every week we probably had three or four events that we were going to. And it was, it, was never, it was never the same thing. It was always exciting because it was, the, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you're looking at it, the one time of the year where we were cognizant of what our mission was, you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, I moved up here about two and a half years ago, my wife and I from uh, from New Orleans, and there's a sister of mine down there who had a movement that she started called Nguzu Saba 365. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nguzu Saba 365, I know Brother Chike kind of alluded to that, that concept. And uh, the thing was, you know, we said, listen, let's change the names of the days of the week. Mm. It's not Sunday no more, it's Mojo. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's not Monday no more, it's Kuja Chocolate. Because the fact is we know that words have power. Yes. The more that we hear, the more subconsciously it seeps into how we live our lives. So if that's the case, if we constantly refer to these uh, these seven sacred principles, we will begin to change how we live our lives. You know? And uh, the last thing I want to say about that is, you know, uh, it's wonderful to be married to my best friend. Uh, my wife and I. She and I spent a lot of time talking, and, and especially over the past uh, few weeks with everything that's been happening, you know, we are growing more and more convinced uh, about the need to be persistent in our commitment to ourselves and our power and our people, our commitment to our values and our principles, because the fact is that now it seems like people are starting to talk about being black. You know what I mean? So, you know, and, and instead of trying to be, you know, calling attention, well, we've been black. Listen, but this is how we've been living our lives. And this is how we've been able to create a path for ourselves. Now, if y'all really interested, let's do this together. Because if you want to go fast, go alone. But now we got all y'all, we're going to go together. We're going to go far. Uh, so with that, I want to thank y'all. It's great to be here. Thank you so very much. And uh, I'll see you on the flip side. Delighted, certainly, that his wife is here. Uh, uh, she's, uh, you may not know, but she teaches at Penn. 
but uh, we'll forgive her for that. <laughs> 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 you got to figure out how to get her over to Temple, too. Right? We're really delighted. We're really delighted to uh, have them here. Uh, we, we are really uh, pleased, and I just want to say once again, uh, you know, Brother Jabba, we really appreciate you for, you know, doing the videoing and, and hanging out with us. I mean, and uh, he's just a wonderful young man. And uh, just want to also recognize Sister uh, Nubia. Um, and uh, Sister Nubia, how you doing? She's one of our undergraduates who helps us a lot. And our little goddaughter, we really have her. You know, I, I used to call her Malcolm X's niece. But really, really, <laughs> <laughs> and, and certainly uh, Sister Ia Ajima, uh, who's teaching at Temple as well. As an right. So, okay, brothers and sisters, uh, the final word we call, uh, I, oh, I just wanted, for, I forgot Brother Asili Perez. He just, uh, been, Brother Asili, we just stand up just one minute again. He is the uh, new uh, person who is uh, going to take over uh, as the Shenudi of uh, Philadelphia chapter. Uh, we've been having a number of meetings. He's a really wonderful brother, and uh, and uh, we, we really appreciate him very much for coming. Okay, uh, we call again upon our ancestors, far and near, the mother of our mothers and the father of our fathers, always to render mercy and always to bear witness for yeah. the liberation and the victory of oppressed people forever. And we say, Ashe. Ashe. Thank you. Just one minute. Just one minute. Just one minute. Oh, yes. Please stand. Please stand. Oh. Thank you very much, Sister. Thank you. Thank you. Right. We're going to do seven uh, around the world. Around